So hi everybody and welcome to the new webinar season, the OMS new webinar season for 2021, Finding Hope with OMS. My name's Sean Southward and I'm the Head of Programmes here at OMS and I'm joining you from London um, in the UK. It's great to see so many of you um, from our OMS community joining us tonight. I can see the, the number of participants, participants ticking up, um, so hopefully there'll be some more to join us. Um, and I can see that you're joining us across um, the world tonight. So we're really excited to have you here to kickstart the new season, um, starting with our introduction to the OMS programme. Um, in a moment, I'll, uh, which is the bit that you've all been waiting for, is that I will introduce our guest presenter for the session, Dr. Jonathan White. But before I do that, um, it's important just to go through a bit of housekeeping rules um, to keep the webinar running as smoothly as possible for you. Um, so just to note that the session is being recorded um, and we'll provide you with the details on how to access it at the end of the session. Uh, the webinar is planned to run for approximately an hour uh, with 15 minutes allowed at the end for Q&A session. Um, you'll also notice because this is a Zoom webinar, there's not an audio um, or video component for our participants. However, it is still an interactive session and you will be able to ask Jonathan um, some questions using the Q&A tab that you'll see um, down below. Um, if somebody um, has already posted a question and you want to show your support for it, you can just click on the thumbs up icon, um, which is also within that Q&A session. Um, and you can also add additional comments too. Um, Sophie, our digital content officer, is going to be collating all those questions in the background. Uh, and I'll be back uh, at the end of the presentation and I'll be putting those forward to uh, Dr. Jonathan. Many thanks uh, to those of you that have submitted questions ahead of the session and hopefully we'll be able to get, get to those um, towards the end of uh, the session. Uh, given the size of the audience, um, it's possible that we won't get through all the questions tonight, but we will be capturing a list of the top 10 um, questions and be posting them on our website, so watch that space. Um, and that will also be made available with the video replay and a handout to accompany uh, tonight's presentation. Um, if you are experiencing any technical glitches, um, try leaving the webinar room um, and re-entering using the link that we sent you through on your email. Um, and for best results, we do recommend using the Chrome browser uh, to access the webinar. So now, without further ado, um, I'm going to give a warm welcome to our presenter for this evening um, for the introduction to the Overcoming MS programme webinar, Dr Jonathan White, who I'm pleased to welcome to the stage now. Hello, Shan. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you for that introduction. Just let me share my screen with you all and we'll get started. <clears throat> <clears throat> so, hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. You're really very welcome to this first episode in our new webinar series, um, Finding Hope with OMS and an introduction to the OMS programme. As Shan said, I'm Jonathan White, more commonly known as Johnny to almost everybody in the world. Um, uh, I'm an obstetrician and gynaecologist by training, I'm not a neurologist. Um, my main er area of, of uh, interest and work is in early pregnancy. Uh, and in recurrent pregnancy losses uh, and I run a clinic uh, in that field uh, in a district general hospital in the north coast of Northern Ireland where I live and work. Um, so you're all really really very welcome today. For some of you it'll be your first um, dipping of a toe into the world of OMS, for others it might be a first experience with MS at all, full stop, and whatever your past experience is Please know that this is a place where hopefully you will find information, support uh, and hope uh, along your journey. Before we get into uh, the main thrust of the presentation, I should probably tell you a little bit about myself and my MS journey. So I was diagnosed with relapsing remitting MS in October 2015. Um, following a very acute onset of symptoms uh, in the months uh, before that, <clears throat> 
And it culminated one Sunday afternoon with me taking myself to my local emergency department uh, and saying, I think I've got MS, I need an MRI scan. And uh, the doctor sort of laughed at me and said, typical medic, overdiagnosing. Um, you probably slipped a disc in your neck, let's get a scan. And the scan showed inflammatory lesions throughout my brain and my spinal cord, so I won that one. Um, and I, I sat in front of a neurologist a few days later who said, well, it's 50-50, you've got clinically isolated syndrome, 50-50 it'll become MS. Um, what we'll do is we'll scan you in six weeks and uh, if there are new lesions, then you qualify for treatment. So six weeks later, I sat in front of her again with my fiance, my wife, Jenny, and was told there are two more lesions on that scan. Not, I'm very sorry, Johnny, uh, you have MS, but there are two more lesions on that scan. And that's a, a different talk for a different day on how you impart uh, bad news on people. But um, that certainly wasn't the way I would have chosen to find out that life-changing diagnosis. From that day on, I um, decided that I needed to find out more about this disease because I didn't know very much about it um, and what I could do to help me stay well. And I asked the neurologist, I said, is there anything I should be doing? Do I need to change my diet, um, reduce alcohol, caffeine, start smoking and then stop smoking, uh, exercise more, lose weight? And she said, no, there's no evidence for any of that. Um, just take the medication that we give you and uh, hope for the best. And I thought to myself, that, that just doesn't sound right. This is a disease that didn't really exist 100 years ago, and yet now there are almost 3 million people around the world affected by MS. Genetics don't change that fast. There's something in our environment, what we eat, toxins in the environment, etc., must be playing a role in this. And it led me on a quest, which fortunately uh, found uh, George Jelinek, Professor George Jelinek's work in the Overcoming MS textbook, which I inhaled in about three days. Um, and it's safe to say it's changed my life ever since. Um, as somebody with MS, it gave me vital information. As a doctor, I greatly appreciated and respected the amount of references and the huge amount of research that had gone into writing the book. But probably most importantly, as a, as a human being, in a very, very dark time, it gave me hope. And it's that hope that I want to try and uh, impart to you today, along with some facts about the OMS programme. Um, before we do that, we probably need to talk a little bit about what MS is, because for some of you, you will be given this life-changing diagnosis and not being told very much about it at all. So what is multiple sclerosis? Multiple is not a particularly scientific word. It just means that there are lesions throughout uh, the body in more than one location. Sclerosis means scarring, thickening, or hardening. So it's not specific to this condition. Uh, for example, atherosclerosis is scarring or thickening or hardening of, of the coronary arteries in the heart. Um, it's a disease of the brain and the spinal cord. And those two things together make the central nervous system or the CNS. The peripheral nervous system, which you may have heard of, is essentially the nerves after the point of the spinal cord and down the limbs, uh, so outside of, of the, the brain and the spinal cord themselves. MS is the most common disabling neurological condition of young adults. It's a condition that's most commonly diagnosed when people are in their 20s and their 30s. And it's three times more common in women than men, but we don't fully understand why that is. Um, currently, there is no cure for multiple sclerosis, but what we are here to tell you over the next uh, number of webinars uh, and through our work in general is that recovery is possible with this condition. Epidemiology is a word we're all too familiar with now, given the COVID-19 pandemic, but it essentially means a study of how often diseases occur in different groups of people and why they happen. We know that approximately one in 600 people in the UK where I live uh, are affected with MS, and that gives us a total of around 130,000. Um, it's around one in a thousand throughout the world, giving us around 3 million people affected by the disease. We also know that the rates increase directly as you move north and south of the equator, which I'll explain later. And we also know that it's becoming more common, partly because we're getting better at monitoring and diagnosing it, but also because it is simply becoming more prevalent. Um, and that's likely due, in, certainly in part, to your increasingly unhealthy lifestyles and, and westernization of the Western diet or standard American diet, as it's often called. There's nothing against America, but it's just often known as SAD. So it's important that we get down to the basics here, the building blocks of the nervous system, and those are neurons. So if you look um, over to the, the left of my screen, um, in the middle, the little rugby ball shaped uh, thing is the nucleus of the cell. That's the command and control center where all the messages from previous cells come in through the dendrites. Um, 
through the cell body into the nucleus where they're assimilated together and then transmitted on down the axon, which is the, the stripe down the middle, to the next cell and the next cell and the next cell. And the thing that increases the speed and the um, stability of that transmission is something called the myelin sheath, which are these little areas around the axon, the coating, a protective coating, if you like, um, like the cabling around your iPhone charger or oil down railway tracks to protect the underlying structure. And myelin's primary role is to increase the speed at which the transmission occurs so that instead of running in a straight line, signals can jump from sheath to sheath. And it's the myelin sheath that is affected by MS that is damaged. And it's, it's damage to the sheath that causes the symptoms that we're all too familiar with. We also need to talk about immunology, which is a filthy word, uh, certainly when I was at medical school, because it is so unbelievably complicated. Um, but in simple terms, and I'm deliberately trying to keep this uh, simple for my own benefit as for all of you, there are two concepts you need to be very aware of when it comes to MS and immunology. The first is a blood-brain barrier, like passport control, which again is um, a hot topic um, in the current uh, circumstances in which we find ourselves. So it's the brain security system. It's an extremely selective barrier that lines the brain's blood vessels. And it's there to stop many substances from getting through and into the brain tissue itself. Really, all the brain wants to get out of the bloodstream is glucose and oxygen and give all the toxins from metabolism within the brain tissues back into the bloodstream to be cleaned. It certainly does not want white blood cells getting across and into it, but in MS, it, they do and it's because the barrier becomes leaky. The other thing that is really important to understand is something called the Th1 and Th2 immune response. It's essentially a seesaw balancing act in the immune system. Now there are lots and lots of different aspects to it, but this specifically refers to the balance of inflammation and anti-inflammation or repair. Th1 is that side of the immune system we need whenever there is a threat or attack. So it's to mount that immune response, to mobilize the troops, if you like, and to prepare for attack. Th2, on the other hand, is when the attack is over, that the, the troops go back to the barracks, that there's anti-inflammation and, and repair being promoted. Neither are good or bad. You need both, but they should be in balance with each other. And in MS, unfortunately, there tends to be a great imbalance towards Th1. Bear with me. So what is it that happens in MS? Well, it's an inflammatory, demyelinating, which means removal of myelin, condition of the CNS. So the immune system, uh, the immune cells, get across the blood-brain barrier when they shouldn't. The immune system mistakenly attacks the myelin sheath. Nerve impulses then are slowed or distorted or not transmitted, and that's what gives us the symptoms. Numbness, the tingling, weakness, balance issues, coordination problems, cognitive issues, bladder, bile, you name it, almost anywhere that a nerve supplies can be affected by MS. And no two people with the condition will have the same symptoms representation. After that initial attack, then scarring forms at that inflammation site. And in the early stages of the condition, you do get some remyelination from the little cells called oligodendrocytes. But with time, that process becomes less efficient and less effective. And we know that over time, if myelin is not coating the nerve fiber, it's extremely prone to damage and destruction. And over time, the nerve fiber often dies. Cell death of the nerve fiber is often called axonal loss, which is something that you may have heard of before. So what causes MS? Well, there's not one cause. There's multiple complex interacting factors at play here. In terms of genes, it's not considered a truly genetic disease, and I'll explain why. Firstly, because there's more than 240 genes implicated. There's not one gene for MS that you have or do not have. It's a, it's a very complicated mix of lots and lots of genes and their code. We also know that the incidence is in, in identical twins, so those that share their DNA completely, is only one in four. So if it was a truly genetic disease, both twins would get it. If one had MS, the other should get it, but that's not the case. So it tells us there's something more than genes involved in this condition. We do know, however, that if you have MS, it does increase the risk of your siblings and your children or your offspring being affected. So the risk is approximately seven times higher for my brother and sister by virtue of my MS, which equates to a risk of around one in 37. For my children, it's five times higher. So it's a risk of one in 67. Remember that in where I live, the risk 
uh, is approximately one in 600 in population. Infection is a really big area of research at the moment. There's no single one agent that's been identified, but there's a great theory or a body of work going towards the theory that Epstein-Barr virus that causes glandular fever uh, could be a, a major contributor to MS. And we know that it's if it is going to be an infection that's playing a part, it has to be one where there's an abnormal delayed immune response to an infection that can lie dormant within the body. And we know that EBV, glandular fever, can do that. We also know that if you never are in contact with EBV, you're very unlikely to develop MS. And that the later in life that you're exposed to it and the worse your symptoms were, from glandular fever, the more likely you are to get MS. So there certainly is a connection that is being actively explored at the moment. Um, in terms of environment, I've already mentioned, we know the incidence is lowest at the equator, and that's probably due to the fact that the sun's uh, UVB rays are strongest there. They weaken directly as you move both north and south, and the incidence in Scotland is approximately the same as it is in the South Island of New Zealand, which are at uh, the same latitudes, north and south. There's some interesting things at play here, though, because we know that if you live in a low risk area to the age of 15, that your risk will remain low, even if you move to a high risk area. So say you were brought up in Central America or in Brazil, for example, and then you moved to Norway um, after the age of 15, your risk would remain low. So there's undoubtedly something in early life and programming the immune system that plays a part in this. Allied to that, we also know that some ethnic groups, particularly the Inuit, um, have a very low incidence of MS, even though they live in a very, very high risk area. They don't have any significant sunlight for at least six months of the year. Probably two factors at least, plus genetics there, one being vitamin D and the other being they're very high, sorry, uh, one being, uh, the major one being omega-3 actually. The fact that they eat so much oily fish is very high in omega-3 and also contains a dose of vitamin D that they may not otherwise get from the low sunlight. Vitamin D itself, well, we know that low levels of the vitamin and in many uh, northern European countries like my own, for example, vitamin D deficiency affects 50 to 80 percent of us during the winter time. So it's incredibly common. Low levels are associated with an increased risk of MS and of also progression of the disease if you do have it. The reason for that is because it's an incredibly potent regulator of the immune system. And Western lifestyles, well, you're going to hear plenty more about that a bit later on. So I've broken all the rules about PowerPoint presentations by putting up the slide, but it's an important one because it shows how complicated the interactions of all the various components are in increasing or reducing your risk. So across the top, we have things that protect you from MS and down below, uh, below the, the center of the line, things that increase your risk. So for example, were you born in the springtime? Were you exposed to EBV? Um, do you have vitamin D insufficiency in early childhood? Do you smoke? Are you obese? All of those things would increase your risk and the opposite decreases it. So it's an extremely complex interaction of genes and environment. The types of MS I'm just going to discuss briefly, but it's suffice it to say that we don't neatly all fit into one box. The classifications are changing rapidly, but there are still essentially four main types of MS, relapsing remitting MS, secondary progressive, primary progressive, and relapsing progressive MS, although that last term is becoming less uh, favorable at the minute. Within relapsing remitting, we have benign MS, clinically isolated syndrome, and rapidly evolving severe RRMS, which is a term that is essentially being coined uh, in the era of the modern disease modifying therapies to try and risk stratify people to who, who needs the more potent therapies or who would be entitled to them. We know that secondary progressive MS affects up to 66% of people after 24 years. So these are people initially diagnosed with relapsing remitting. And primary progressive affects 10 to 15% of those diagnosed. And this is characterized by progressive disability from the outset, usually without relapses, although you can have episodes of relapse as well as progressive disability from the beginning of the disease. That's also a particular hallmark of relapsing progressive, where you get relapses, but you get much less complete uh, remission than you would in relapsing remitting, and you get more rapid progression generally, and that's the rarest type affecting 5%. Because relapsing remitting is the most common, because people new to OMS uh, often have relapsing remitting, and, and those often newly diagnosed are in that category, but not to discount the other types of MS, as I said, it is the most common form and affects 65 to 70% of patients at the outset of the disease. And it's characterized, as you can see in the graph on the right there, by over time, episodes with increasing symptoms, marked as disability here, 
with initially good recovery, almost complete recovery at the start in, in lots of aspects, and over time, a gradual lessening of the recovery and increased burden of disability as time progresses. Um, so traditionally, it's characterized as symptomatic episodes with partial or complete recovery, but that's very misleading because we know that there's a real iceberg phenomenon here. On average, there are 10 lesions on an MRI scan for every one relapse. So you can have an awful lot of active disease, but not know very much about it clinically. A relapse is defined as the appearance of a new symptom or worsening of old symptoms that last for over 24 hours. But in the early stages of the disease, personally for me, I find it extremely hard to tell what was a bad day and what was a relapse. I find that very, very difficult. And that's a story that you hear very often. Um, the frequency of relapses and the severity of the symptoms are extremely unpredictable and vary hugely from person to person. But we know on average, um, without treatment, there are one to two relapses annually in what we call the natural history of the disease. The medical therapies, uh, the DMDs or DMTs as they're called, reduce relapse frequency and some have now been shown to uh, slow disease progression over time. In terms of the impact of the condition uh, in a UK centric model, the cost to our economy here is 4.2 or up to 4.2 billion pounds annually. We know that employment status varies hugely, but that early retirement affects probably a quarter of people uh, with MS in Europe. And on average, it results in a loss of 10 working years, perhaps through sick leave, uh, less than full-time working and or retirement. We know that half 50% of people with MS suffer at least one clinical episode of depression, and one in four people uh, could be diagnosed with PTSD symptoms following the, the actual process of diagnosis. You don't need me to tell you that impacts upon the whole family uh, and everyone that cares about you and most people that you care about. Uh, most people are diagnosed at a time in their life when they're making really major life decisions, uh, starting or changing career. Do they settle down and get married? Do they start a family? Do they take a year off and go and travel the world? Um, do they start a new crazy hobby? It's also really important that we bust some myths about MS. And there are many. So the first to say is that MS does slightly reduce your life expectancy by around six years. But I would hasten to add that that is a figure that was coined many years ago at a time when the treatments were much less effective and much less commonly used. Um, to also put it into perspective, a diagnosis of diabetes will reduce your life expectancy by around 10 years on average. So MS is not considered a terminal illness, despite what some insurance companies will say. The majority of people will not need to use a wheelchair regularly. We know that uh, over two thirds of people are ambulant still uh, after 20 years uh, living with the condition. You should not reduce your levels of physical activity by virtue of having MS. In fact, the opposite, as I will explain. And you won't necessarily have to stop working just by virtue of the disease or the condition. Importantly, for those of us who are uh, of childbearing age or, or female, there's no direct effect on pregnancy outcomes. So there's no increased risk of miscarriage, of stillbirth, of small babies, of early babies. There is a slightly increased risk of cesarean section, but that's generally due to uh, obstetric anxiety rather than any um, direct correlation between the condition uh, and the pregnancy itself. We also know that pregnancy is protective and that relapse rates are generally reduced during pregnancy. And in what we call the postpartum period after baby is born, there is a medium to long term up to three year benefit uh, in terms of relapses and disability progression from pregnancy. Breastfeeding is protective both to the mother and to the baby. And we know that exclusive breastfeeding for six months reduces the child's incidence of MS by approximately 50% throughout their lifetime. So it cannot be over estimated in its importance there. So to the OMS program then. Um, it was previously been known as the seven step OMS recovery program. But really, it's probably best not to think of it as step by step and following a ladder, but rather of a circular diagram where all the parts connect together, the, uh, because the, the sum of all of this is much greater than the individual parts. So namely, the parts of that circle are diet, sunlight and vitamin D, exercise, meditation, medication, family prevention, and change your life for life. And we're going to spend some time now just going through each of those um, various components. 
So if anybody knows anything about the OMS program, they usually know that it involves a diet and it is the cornerstone of the OMS, OMS program. Um, contrary to what most people think, it is not a low fat diet, it's a low saturated fat diet and that's very important. The primary evidence for that comes from Professor Roy Swank, who's the gentleman on the right of the screen, and his pioneering work um, on the west coast of America in the 1950s, where he followed 150 people with MS and also their families, because in those days people listened to their doctors and did what they were told, and if he said, you're starting this diet for your MS, generally the whole family did the same thing. Remarkably, he followed those people for 34 years, and in fact, actually almost 50 years of follow-up over time. Um, if you think that the average drug trial lasts a year, two years, three, five years at most, that is truly astounding. It was also published in The Lancet in 1990, which is consistently one of the um, highest peer-reviewed journals in terms of rank throughout the world. But unfortunately, his findings were largely ignored by the medical community. To briefly explain why, um, Professor Swank started his uh, study in a time when evidence-based medicine didn't exist. So he was being judged then when he published his results by a standard that didn't exist when he started. So there was criticism that those investigating the people with MS following the diet and not following the diet knew which the doctors taking the results knew which group the patient was in and that could lead to bias. And that is a very valid point. But given that the, the facts that they were recording were was the patient well and ambulant, did they use a stick? Were they wheelchair bound? Were they bed bound or were they dead? It's, it is rather difficult to, to see how that in all good consciousness and faith, they could be faking those results. Regardless of that criticism, it had remarkable results. It showed that a diet low in saturated fat, so under 20 grams per day, significantly reduced disability accumulation rates and disease progression over time. It reduced relapses by 80% at one year and by 95% at five years. 34 years later, so this is at least 34 years after diagnosis of MS, 95% in the low fat group were well and they were ambulant. This next graph is extremely important because what it shows is um, the thick black line at the top shows people who adopted the uh, program early in their disease. Sorry, excuse me, my computer's decided to change randomly. Um, those starting uh, following the diet and keeping to under 20 grams of saturated fat a day over time remained remarkably stable in terms of their disability neurograde, which you can see remained constant at around one. For those that had more significant disability uh, and started neurograde three or two and a half to three, which is roughly um, the old day equivalent of the new EDSS that we often use to score disability, if they followed the low saturated fat diet, they also remained remarkably stable and none of them had died at the 34 year mark. The lines that slope downwards are those that started early in their disease course, later in their disease course, and didn't follow the sat low saturated fat diet. And you can see that the trend is exactly the same again, that they deter deteriorated over time. And at the end of the 34 year study, 78% in that group had unfortunately died and 91% in the lower line had also died. So it's an extremely important graph to understand that remaining on that diet for that length of time kept their MS disability levels essentially completely static. So why, why does it matter? Well, it's because you are what you eat. What you put in your mouth three to five times a day is your single greatest interaction with the environment. Remember that your cells are made of everything that you eat. Um, the reason that it all comes down to fat here is because on the right, you will see a cell membrane. This is a scanning electron micrograph of the um, phospholipid bilayers, it's often called, that makes up the cell membrane of every single cell in our bodies. Those cell membranes are made of fats. Fats and oils are, are both the same thing. Fat generally means a solid, oil means a liquid, but they're all made up of smaller building blocks called fatty acids. And these are the things that make up our cell membranes. Saturated fats are those that are generally solid at room temperature, such as butter or the rind on a, on a chop. They mainly come from animals. When they are incorporated into the body, 
They are rigid, they are sticky, they're inflammatory, and they're degenerative. None of these things are something that I want as somebody with a chronic degenerative neurological condition. Polyunsaturated fats, meaning many unsaturated bonds in those little fatty acids, uh, two of which you might have heard of being omega-3 and omega-6, are generally liquids, and they mainly come from plants and from seafoods. These, in turn, when they are digested and incorporated into our body and absorbed, make cell membranes soft, flexible, less sticky, and they resist degeneration. Also, these are the building blocks for the signals that the immune system uses to tell other parts of the body to light up inflammation or to rest and repair. So omega-3 are generally very anti-inflammatory, and omega-6 is slightly more complicated, but are also uh, generally pro-inflammatory. We know that diets high in omega-3 shift that all-important immune balance to Th2. So some of you who may have been doing some digging into OMS will perhaps have heard of the Holism study, which is Professor Jelinek's work at the NEU at the University of Melbourne. And that essentially took 1,500 people around the world uh, with MS and followed them up through self-reporting questionnaires as to various aspects of their health, their quality of life, mental quality of life, and various other factors. And what we find was that people on a meat-free and dairy-free diet had a significantly better quality of mental and physical health. Those taking daily flaxseed oil, and we would normally advise 20 to 40 mils of um, fresh, uh, cool-pressed flaxseed oil daily with the OMS program, which is extremely high in omega-3, had a 60% reduced relapse rate. And we also find that eating fish three times weekly reduced the relapse rate by 50%. Dairy, uh, many will know, is a bit of a no-no uh, on the OMS program. In fact, it's, it's an absolute no-no for two reasons. There's a protein within uh, dairy milk called butyrophilin that is extremely like myelin. It shares a lot of the structure with myelin. So to those who have an immune autoimmune response against myelin, it, it's extremely pro-inflammatory pro and it's akin to throwing petrol in a lit bonfire. So there's one aspect there and also it's extremely high in saturated fat. So those two things together are not good if you have multiple sclerosis. For those who enjoy a tipple, you'll be happy to hear that those taking moderate amounts of alcohol following their local uh, national uh, guidance, actually had a, a better quality of life than those people who took very low or little alcohol or those who took too much alcohol as by standard definitions. So OMS recommends a plant-based whole food diet plus seafood supplemented with 20 to 40 mils of flaxseed oil daily. There's obviously much more we could talk about there but that would be the subject of a separate webinar where you'll learn some really helpful tips and recipes and a bit more about the science behind things. So sunlight and vitamin D. Well, vitamin D, as I've said, has a key role in uh, regulating the immune system and in protecting the brain. We know that there is evidence in a whole host of conditions for the benefit of vitamin D in terms of reducing depression rates, hypertension or high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, some cancers, and in my own field, pregnancy losses. There is substantial evidence, particularly for vitamin D and MS prevention and in reducing the severity of the disease. We know that 75% of cases of MS could be prevented if vitamin D levels were over 100 nanomoles per litre, which is the unit we use uh, in Europe and Australia and New Zealand. Um, higher vitamin D levels result in less new lesions, less relapses and less shrinkage or atrophy of the brain over time. And if you were to increase your blood level of vitamin D by 50 nanomoles per litre, that was found in one study to reduce relapses by 57% and reduce new lesions also by 57%. We also see that over time, higher levels lead to less disability progression. It's made in the skin on exposure to the sun's UVB rays. So UVA gives you the tan, UVB is responsible for vitamin D and UVC is filtered out by the ozone layer. Its primary function is to absorb calcium, magnesium and phosphate from our guts and it's essential for growth and bone health. The skin will manufacture about approximately 1,000 units per minute to a maximum of 15,000 units daily. But that only happens if you're in UV index 7 or above, which in many places, north and south of the equator, you're not, and you need to be nearly naked in, in the sun exposure. So exposing less skin for longer will not increase vitamin D synthesis further because there is a limited amount of conversion that can occur in any one area of skin. As I've said before, the UV index decreases directly as you move north and south of the equator. 
And importantly, we also know that small regular amounts of sunlight and sun exposure are perfectly safe and they actually may prevent skin cancers, especially malignant skin cancers such as melanoma. Um, if you are to get out in the sun, it's best to take your 10, 15 minutes before you put your sun cream on and then put the sunscreen on because even factor eight or above will completely filter out UVB. Of course, you should stop at the point before you start to burn if you have very sensitive skin. So in the OMS program, we're aiming for a blood level of 150 to 225 nanomoles per liter, or if you're in America, 60 to 90 nanograms per milliliter. Um, it's really important to say that that level would often be considered high on some laboratory reports, but it is perfectly safe in the vast majority of people. Vitamin D toxicity is extremely rare. It is only uh, even a vague small possibility at levels of probably 400 animals per liter, but more likely 600 animals per liter. And you need to take huge doses to achieve that. The dose that we advocate is between five and 10,000 international units of vitamin D daily, or 15 minutes of sun exposure three to five times a week. If your levels are very low uh, on your first test or when you're first diagnosed, which is very common, a one-off megadose of say 600,000 units is a very safe way to quickly increase your blood levels. It's safe in pregnancy and breastfeeding. And in fact, it's extra important in breastfeeding and pregnancy. Many governments around the world routinely advise a level or a, a daily supplement of 400 or at most 800 units daily. But it's important to say that um, international endocrinology bodies would argue that doses of up to 4,000 units a day for anybody are perfectly safe. So we're not advocating doses much higher than that in certain people. Um, but we also know that 10,000 units a day for the huge majority of people uh, are absolutely safe. We also know that testing of your vitamin D levels can be difficult in the public sector. The NHS in the UK will often not provide this, even though it only costs six pounds to the laboratory to do it. But it can be arranged online. So there are two examples there. But depending where you live, there are almost certainly um, available options. Um, both of those are around 40 pounds sterling and give you results within about 72 hours. I would usually suggest that you have your vitamin D levels tested once in the spring and once in the autumn so that you know what dose to, to take then over the winter months and also whether or not you can reduce your dose going in through the spring and summer when the sun will be strongest. So exercise then. We all know that exercise is good for us and has many positive effects. So it reduces our blood pressure, our cholesterol levels, our risk of infections protects us against heart disease, stroke, cancers, type two diabetes, osteoporosis, and dementia. And it reduces the risk of early death from all causes by up to 30%. In many chronic disease uh, conditions, exercise regularly is as effective as many medications. And in fact, there's a publication today saying that in people with poor sleep habits or lack of sleep, that exercise can be really protective for the brain. In the past, People with MS were told to avoid exertion. And I was told this when I was diagnosed, don't raise your heart rate too high, that could be dangerous. I'm not sure where that comes from. It doesn't even make sense scientifically. Um, but we now know that there are huge benefits from regular exercise if you have MS. Increases muscle strength, energy levels, reduces fatigue, increases walking speed, sexual function, bile, bladder function, and overall quality of life. It halves your risk of depression, and it improves your cognitive performance, your information processing, and your problem-solving abilities. In part, we think that's because it stimulates the neurons, those little building blocks of the central nervous system, and it strengthens the connections between them, which is really important. Um, it reduces brain shrinkage, so it slows the rate of atrophy in the brain, which we know is higher and quicker in people with MS. And it also appears to slow disease progression over time. It promotes neuroprotection, neuroregeneration, and unfortunately that little picture has covered up neuroplasticity, which means if there were a block in a road, uh, say by damaged nerve fibers, for example, that the signal can be transmitted around that. And that's an extremely important thing in MS and recovery from relapses. It has marked anti-inflammatory effects and it promotes that TH2 balance that we've been talking about that's so key. Um, before I go any further, I just want to give a, a quick mention to that lovely lady in the top right, who some of you may know is Veronique Gutierrez-Simmons, who has been working as an OMS facilitator with me now for, I think, almost four years. She is an amazing advocate of yoga, of breath work, of exercise, of movement, uh, of joie de vivre, pardon my French accent, 
um, and is a fantastic advocate for the work of OMS. You'll find many of her videos um, on our OMS website, and I encourage you to, to have a look at them. We know that the greatest benefits are found in those who go from sedentary lifestyles, so doing very little regular exercise, to regular moderate intensity exercise. And moderate intensity is usually defined as something where you can talk as you do it, but you couldn't sing. I, mean, I personally have never been able to sing doing any form of exercise, but there you go. Um, you should start low and increase slowly. It is okay to push yourself with MS. You're not going to bring on a relapse by lifting one extra rep or or swimming a little bit further or walking a bit further. It's okay to go to the point of fatigue ability, but you also have to be mindful of limitations of fatigue, of weakness, et cetera. And some people will find that the increase in body temperature uh, with exercise provokes symptoms. So um, we know that endurance training, so bands and weight exercises generally will cause less body temperature rise and will provoke less symptoms in those who are heat sensitive. A qualified trainer can be really, really helpful in designing a suitable program for your abilities. And two uh, resources I've just highlighted are uh, one, the MS Gym uh, with Trevor Wicken, who we have a partnership with, as well as Dr. Gretchen Hawley and the MSing link. OMS recommends 30 minutes of exercise three to five times a week. And that is just what the standard recommendation is by many governments around the world. So it's nothing extra, but it is extra important. So meditation and mindfulness now. And um, this is the thing that I personally struggle with the most when I uh, embarked on the OMS program approximately five and a half years ago. It's something I still struggle with slightly, if I'm being completely honest, but it's a vital part of my own journey with this condition. Um, mindfulness is defined rather arbitrarily as paying attention in a particular way on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally by John Kabat-Zinn, who's widely thought of as the sort of father of modern secular uh, mindfulness meditation. There is a vast, vast evidence base on the connection between the mind and the body and how that in turn, impact on, how that in turn impacts upon our health. We know that stress and major life events can trigger MS relapses um, because they provoke a very strong Th1 immune response. There's very clear literature to say that four to six weeks after a major stress event, relapse rates in MS significantly increase. And I have personal experience of that. And it really goes back to the evolutionary fight or flight response, the saber-toothed tiger when we lived in the cave, if you like. When we see a threat, the body doesn't, it doesn't matter what that threat might be, the response is the same. It's increased adrenaline secretion from the glands on top of the kidneys to increase our heart rate or blood pressure, to send blood to our muscles in case we have to fight or to run, and also to turn on inflammation. We're expecting insult and injury. We need to be ready to mobilize the immune system and to thicken the blood uh, to, in case we have a, a life-threatening injury and, and hemorrhage. So those things are okay should there be a short-lived threat such as a saber-toothed tiger. It's not okay when that threat is imaginary or it's never ending potentially. Worrying about family, bills, job, commitments. We can't avoid stress, but we can change how we respond to it. And meditation very clearly has been shown to shift the immune balance over to that Th2 side of the, the seesaw, which should be fed up hearing about, as I've said lots of times already. Studies have shown that regular mindfulness practice increases the gray and white matter in MRI scans. It promotes neuroplasticity, so that rerouting of signals around damaged areas and creating new neural networks. Um, there's a fascinating area of research um, regarding telomeres, and telomeres are the little caps on the ends of our DNA strands in each of our cells. And we know that they get shorter as we age, and as they shorten, um, the risk of age-related diseases increases. It has been clearly shown now that mindfulness lengthens telomeres and prevents them getting shorting, shorten, shortening over time rather, and that in turn reduces your cellular age and in fact is effectively making you younger. It improves quality of life and protects against depression, specifically in MS, and NICE, the um, regulatory body in the UK, uh, now has mindfulness as a uh, first line treatment for depression and anxiety. We recommend 30 minutes of meditation daily. And I just want to draw your attention down to the bottom right of the screen, which is a film uh, called The Connection, made by Shannon Harvey, who's a great friend of OMS and is available on iTunes uh, and features, amongst others, um, Professor George Jelinek and Dr. Craig Hassett. Um, this is a film that we have shown at our retreats previously. 
and is a really great introduction into the field of mind body medicine if you're interested in pursuing it. So medication briefly, we could obviously talk about this uh, at a webinar in its own right, but it's important to say that OMS is not against disease modifying drugs. I think in the past there was a perception that OMS was the slightly alternative area to pursue and if you were going down that route you were then against medication and it was us versus them. That could not be further from the truth. It should be a case of us and them together. We know that early medical treatments can alter the disease course in MS, but there are many issues to consider when you choose a treatment. And you need to take time and have the space and opportunity to address these with your doctor and or your MS nurse. And that often in the modern health system is sadly and sorely lacking because you need the support, the time, the space to weigh up the benefits with the risks of potentially very serious side effects that can come with these medications. Um, currently, there are 12 uh, disease modifying drugs licensed to treat relapsing and remitting MS. They have been shown to uh, variably reduce relapse rates and the severity of, of the relapse, but also to reduce uh, disease progression. One treatment has now been licensed for active secondary progressive MS called saponamod, and one is licensed to treat early primary progressive MS, which is called ocrelizumab. There are criteria for both of these drugs, um, and it, it, the availability changes depending on where you live and your healthcare systems. But the point to remember here is that this was not the case even two years ago, and that the landscape of progressive MS treatments is changing rapidly, as is that of relapsing or many MS. Prevention for family members then. For some of us, this is possibly the most important uh, area of the OMS programme. For others, it's not a concern, but it is worth taking a moment to discuss. We know probably that genetics accounts for around 25% of an individual's risk of MS. So that remaining 75% is the environment uh, in which you live and what you expose yourself to. So if you think of uh, genes effectively load the gun, but your environment pulls the trigger, is the analogy that's often used. So one uh, really uh, potent pull on the trigger is cigarette smoking. It doubles your risk of developing MS in your lifetime, and you're four times more likely to develop progressive MS and on average eight years earlier. And that's a dose dependent effect. So the more you smoke, the more likely it is. Passive smoking around a child doubles their lifetime risk of MS. So it's vitally important that you keep children away from passive smoking. And of course, smoking in general. Um, vitamin D, we know that low dose of frequency on exposure uh, and it were in the winter time, 5,000 units daily, aiming for a level of 100 nanomoles per litre. This is a prevention rather than people who already have MS, is perfectly safe and could reduce um, the incidence of MS, as I said, by around 75%. The dose for children and babies is uh, lower and it's usually 1,000 units per 10 kilograms. But that um, supplementation with vitamin D for babies should start for the mum in her pregnancy. Diets, it's um, difficult obviously to study diets in people who don't have MS and follow them up to find out what the outcomes were, but Swank did do that. And in the families that adopted the low saturated fat diet, there were zero reported cases of MS. So we would extrapolate that with the slightly updated and changed version of the OMS program, which is, uh, reflects modern um, understanding of dietetics, which is plant-based and whole food, plus or minus seafood, that that should also have a protective and positive effect with additional supplementary flaxseed oil to provide omega-3. Stress is unavoidable, but we can stress better. We can find ways of coping with stress, of managing our stress, and doing it together as a family unit and with your friends. As Benjamin Franklin said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, and never a truer word was spoken. So to hark back to the holism study and what it showed about the program in general, well, improved health outcomes with the OMS program. A 60% relapse rate reduction with flaxseed oil, 42% less chance of disability progression with a healthy fat diet, reducing relapse rates by a third on any dose of vitamin D, and a significant risk uh, reduction in depression and fatigue levels. Part two of holism is now being analysed to see how these changes to lifestyle affect MS in the long term. 
put into a rather complicated regression analysis, if we look across the variables going down the columns, so disability, quality of life, et cetera, and on the right, um, lifestyle factors such as smoking or alcohol use. Green is positive, orange is a negative effect, and the greater the size of the arrow, the greater the effect. So for example, the healthy diet um, reduced uh, disability levels, flaxseed oil had a greater effect, for example, as did moderate to high physical activity levels. You'll note that there are a couple of, of orange, uh, most of these refer to the fact that possibly people with higher disability levels were doing more meditation to try and help their disability, therefore the correlation. And we also know that depression and fatigue in the early stages, when or early stages of DMDs, when the first holism was done, there was a really strong correlation with certainly the interferons uh, causing fatigue and um, flu like symptoms associated with depression. But generally, the take home message from that slide is of the many and varied benefits in terms of all aspects of uh, our lifestyle. Uh, and many aspects then of quality of life and relapse rates, et cetera, through the OMS program. A further study performed by Professor Jelinek's team is called the STOP MS study. So these follow people who have been to uh, an OMS style retreat uh, and then following them uh, for five years following that five day residential retreat. If we look at the blue line, which is the overall quality of life, we see a very rapid increase in the first year. So a 10% positive uh, increase uh, measure of quality of life and at the five-year mark that change is 20 percent so an average the average person has a 20 percent increase in their overall physical quality of life and even greater um, benefit in terms of their mental health uh, quality there's not many interventions in the world of ms that would quote rates such as that remember this is a condition that's traditionally associated with decline over time uh, not improvement so the last aspect is about changing your life and changing it for the rest of your life and for life. On the top right, you see the acronym SMART. And this is a, a bit of a buzzword used in the science of change at the moment, that if you're any, any variable you're changing should be a specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely change. You are not to blame for getting MS, but you are the best person to deal with it. The way that OMS firmly believes is the best way to deal with it is to eat a plant-based whole food diet plus seafood if you like with daily flaxseed oil to get enough vitamin D either through sunlight or by taking five to ten thousand units a day. Exercise for 30 minutes three to five times per week, meditate for 30 minutes daily, work with your doctor and take medication if it's necessary and right for you and prevention for your family members. All the elements we've talked about are effective in their own right, but the stop and the study shows that they work best when they're put together. But this is a choice and it's your choice. Um, I believe, uh, as do many people, increasing numbers of people around the world, that the scientific evidence behind the OMS program is extremely compelling and gets stronger all the time. But we can't make you make that change. Um, the choice is yours. We know that changing habits it can be difficult and it can take time. On average, it's around 66 days to change a habit. And the odd slip up along the way doesn't materially affect the outcome, the formation of new habits. I want to just point out a book that I read about a year ago, well, maybe two years ago now, that I find remarkable and so interesting and really clarified for me the science of change. It's by James Clear. It's called Atomic Habits. And it's to do with the tiny, tiny little changes that we can make in our daily lives that cumulatively have a massive positive impact. Uh, the analogy often uses about the Sky Cycling team, and they made all these micro gains in terms of bringing their own duvets and pillows, and they found that incre that increased performance by X percent, which coupled with Y achieved further improvements. And it's a really fascinating read, and I, I would recommend it to you. Just as a final thought or two, um, Dr. Paul Abersole was a physicist in uh, California in the 1950s. Uh, and a real pioneer in that field. And he basically found that over the course of 12 months, 98% of the atoms in your body change. So 12 months from now, 90% of the atoms you currently have will not be there. There's constant turnover and recycling and renewal. So it is never too late to make a change. I can't uh, finish without sharing my own philosophy. For those of you, of you who have heard me speak before, 
um, you're going to have to close your ears for 20 seconds because you'll, you will have heard it. Um, I am not a great poet. Uh, I, I do enjoy reading, but I'm not a greatly learned in the field of literature, but I do love films and I really love the James Bond films. And I'm a huge fan of Judy Dench and I love the film Skyfall and the scene in particular where she's being grilled um, in the House of Commons Select Committee. And she quotes a poem that her husband taught her, which for me sums up my own philosophy to MS as a condition and to OMS uh, as a way of living. That's by Alfred Lord Tennyson. Though much is taken, much abides, and though we are not now that strength, which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will, to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. Thank you very much for listening and for joining us today. I hope you have uh, learned something new. I hope it's and put you on the path to, to OMS, or maybe just giving you something to think about uh, in your journey with MS. But whatever that might be, I wish you health and happiness and every success. So thank you very much. Thanks, Johnny. What, a, well, what an amazing presentation. Um, you'll be pleased to hear that we've had loads of questions going on in the background. <laughs> um, and um, what we said is we'll actually, we'll go through a few because obviously people yeah. have taken the time to submit ahead. So we'll be really you know, pleased if people hang on um, and listen to some of the answers. Like I said, we'll try and um, pick a top 10 anyway and put those back onto the website. But yeah. if we could just maybe go through a couple um, while we've still got people. Um, so one of the first ones there is, what about people with additional conditions to MS? How does yep. that affect the OMS program, um, especially diet and allergens? Well, if there are specific um, concerns such as you know, gluten sensitivity, for example, or celiac disease, then yes, it's, it's worth um, obviously consulting with a dietitian, but it's important to say that you don't need to routinely give up gluten as by virtue of following OMS or having MS. With regards to other health conditions, I can't really think off the top of my head of any specific ones that would be absolute contraindications. In fact, there are many conditions, certainly inflammatory ones, where there is evidence to say that a plant-based diet is very beneficial. Uh, there's evidence for benefit in terms of many um, chronic Western diseases, so heart attacks, strokes, and cancers, diabetes. So um, there's very little to be lost and quite a lot to be gained. Um, we often say to partners of people who are following the OMS program, if they do it too, then the best thing that they might get from it is uh, prevents them getting most of the diseases that unfortunately make us sick or kill us in the Western world. So um, I would say go for it, generally speaking. If there's any doubt, consult your GP, uh, your family doctor, uh, or speak to a nutritionist or a dietitian. But generally speaking, full steam ahead. Thank you. Um, next one, we've had quite a lot of um, questions actually about supplements, so can we talk yeah. supplements? Um, what's the advice in relation to taking them within the OMS program? Yeah, it's pretty simple. Um, the only two supplements that we routinely recommend are uh, flax oil for omega-3 and vitamin D, as I discussed. For those who are completely vegan, so they don't consume any seafood, they should supplement with B12 because you won't get vitamin B12 from a purely plant-based diet. Um, you don't need extra B12 by virtue of having MS uh, or following OMS, but you do need to make sure you're meeting that 100% recommended daily allowance a day. Other than that, there are many, many supplements out there. We could list off hundreds of them. The reason that they're not included in the OMS program is because the evidence base for them is, is not too strong or complete. Um, but generally speaking, there isn't there is an additional benefit, certainly in taking a multivitamin, for example. In fact, uh, there's evidence to say that people taking multivitamins have an increased all course mortality rate. So um, it's not generally uh, a good idea to throw random supplements into the mix. Uh, certainly, if you're considering one, do a bit of research. If you have a query, send it into us and I'll be happy to look at it. But it's pretty simple with regards to OMS. The basic supplements are omega-3 and vitamin D. Thank you. Um, another question here. Can the peripheral nerves get sclerosis and scars? So um, peripheral nerves are not affected um, 
by MS. There is a um, similar condition that affects peripheral nerves, but it's not it's not multiple sclerosis. That's the central nervous system that's affected. Okay, going back to the program, what are the benefits? When are the benefits of the program likely to be felt, and how long do they last for? Yeah. So this is a really good question. Um, we are, I think Shan's gonna plug this uh, a bit later on, but we're always desperate to find out more about people with their MS and with the OMS program. But from the data that we have, we know on average, it takes around three to five years to see the full effect of the program. And if you think that you're having to rebuild every cell in your body from the ground up and change all those little membranes around the cells with the polyunsaturated fatty acids that you're now consuming, it's not a bit of wonder, it's like turning around an oil tanker. So it does take time. But that said, you should expect to start feeling the benefits of it much sooner than that. I know that I started to feel uh, a lot better within a few months of starting the program. And what I would suggest most people or anyone do is to keep a diary of your symptoms so that you know that when you start, I started here and these are the symptoms that I had and I scored them, out of, I personally scored them from one to 10 as to how bad they were. And I could notice really clearly over the weeks and months that those scores starting out at eights and sevens were becoming six, fives, fours, threes, and in fact, some ones and zeros, um, which largely touch wood remains the case. So uh, it does take time. I'm not gonna lie to you and say it's an overnight fix. Um, it's not easy, but the vast majority of people will find benefit from this. Uh, and after weeks and months, those benefits should become apparent. Um, in terms of how long they last, which is a very good one, we know that um, there are certain people who find that they feel much better on the OMS program and then think that they're cured of their MS and they might then fall off the wagon, so to speak. Uh, unfortunately, then we do know that within um, months to years, a couple of years after that, that they often do get a flare up of their symptoms. So my advice and my personal philosophy is that if it keeps you well, keep doing it. Um, I can honestly hand on heart say that if I didn't have MS tomorrow, I would not change one tiny thing from the OMS program. I wouldn't go back to eating the steak and cheese that I consumed by the ton in my previous life. I eat much better. I feel much better. No downsides whatsoever for me. Thank you for that. Um, sort of linked to that, and obviously this yep. session is primarily aimed at those that have either been, you know, recently diagnosed or new to the um, OMS program. So somebody yeah. said, it sounds like there are lots of things that we need to do, but where would you recommend is a good place to start? Yeah, I think that's a really, really good, it's a really important question. It can seem totally overwhelming. Um, it did for me, I'm human. It took me six months before, probably before I had really got a handle of it completely at the start. Um, if I had to pick one thing to start, it would be the diet. And there are lots of schools of thought about whether you go cool turkey, gradually introduced. There's a bit of personal choice involved in that. What I would say is that temptation is the devil in, in human nature. And for me, what I did was I clear out, cleared out all of the old stuff that I used to love eating and I knew wasn't doing me any good. I went round my local supermarket and it took a long time that first time. It was very daunting. It was quite frustrating. But once I'd filled the cupboards with things that I could eat, once I'd got my routine of what I have on a Wednesday night and what we'll have on a Monday night because we're all creatures of habit and once I had done that and found my resources and my recipe books and my blogs online and all of those things um I never looked back it was and it's now I don't even give it a second thought the diet is completely second nature to me um that's that is where I would start and I would strongly advise that um the things to if, if you're trying to reduce meat consumption for example and I did that so I I instantly stopped all red meat being higher in saturated fat, but I did continue to eat some poultry for the first six months as a way of bridging over to seafood because I didn't really like seafood before and I love it. Um, but so I would, I would try and give up red meat pretty quickly, cool turkey, pardoning the pun. And I would also stop dairy straight away. You don't need dairy. Um, we're the only mammal that continues to take dairy after we're weaned. Um, all the plant-based milks are supplemented with the same amount of calcium per hundred mils as dairy milk is. Um, there's actually a trend towards increased rates of osteoporosis in dairy drinkers, so you don't need it for strong bones, etc. That's the thing to give up uh, cold turkey quickly, because that's where you're taking most of your saturated fat daily, and you're also obviously consuming beta often, which can play havoc with those prone to MS. So that's the first one. Thank you. Um, we've had a couple of questions actually around uh, vitamin D, um, so, and quite a specific one here, but how much vitamin D should I give to my child? Yeah, so um, 
as I mentioned earlier, uh, generally what we would advise is 1,000 units per 10 kilos of weight. So if your baby is 20 kilos, that wouldn't be a baby, that'll be a bit of a big baby. Um, 20 kilos would be 2,000 units per day. So my um, eight month old is now 11 kilos. So I give him a spray once a day under his tongue of 1,000 units. Generally speaking, once they get to 50 kilos, then that equates to just 5,000 units. And once they're at that size, then it's just the, the adult preventative dose uh, and 5,000 units uh, a day. Thank you for that. Um, I'm just going to finish on this one, Johnny, because um, we've had a couple about fasting. So you're going to have to um, excuse my pronunciation. Okay. Does the 16-8 intermittent fasting promote myelin sheath repair and reduce inflammation with auto? Uh, yeah, that's the one you say it. Yeah. So um, that's a really good question and there's no short answer to it. Uh, that's a, a massive topic which is being investigated by lots of people around the world. One of the great leaders of this would be Walter Longo, who wrote the Longevity Diet book, which I would highly recommend. It's really good. Um, there is evidence to say that um, fasting uh, is essentially like a mini stem cell transplant. There are lots of different ways of doing it, but when you get to the right time and the right level of ketosis, it can promote, uh, as Shan so neatly put it, autophagy, which is essentially clearing out of the immune system. So what happens is, the first thing that happens is that the immune system clears out all those little cells that are autoreactive, the ones that attack you incorrectly, so the autoimmune response. There's lots of different ways of doing it. There's intermittent fasting, there's the 12-12, um, 16-8, there's five-day fast, there's water fasts. Uh, no one is has been proven over another yet, but there's a lot of research going on. And actually, specifically, there are now trials in humans with MS uh, on that one. What I would say about 16-8 specifically, though, is that Walter Longo uh, was very clear in that he, he's not a fan of that one. He advocates that everybody does 12-12 every day. I, I personally try to fast for 12 hours a day, so from uh, 8 to 8 each day. In those doing 16-8, where those who, so you're avoiding foods and calories for 16 hours a day, there is an increased risk of um, gallbladder disease and some evidence of heart disease too, but that may be by the virtue of the fact that those people in that group had other factors in their lifestyle that contributed to it, so we're not sure, um, but probably best to avoid 16-8 and go 12-12 as, as your standard one. And then there are certain people who will say do two days a week where they fast for 24 hours or other people who do no fasting and then a couple of times a year do the five-day fasting mimicking diet. There's no one that's better than another at the minute, but it's a real exciting watch this space phenomenon. And um, yeah, we'll keep you updated on that one. There is some information about fasting uh, in some of our blogs on our website already. So, so go and check that out if you're interested. Thank you, Johnny. I mean, that's been amazing tonight. Um, I knew that Sophie was going to pick one of the questions that I couldn't pronounce one of the words. Just well, she's always going to do that. Yeah. <laughs> but you covered for me so well. Um, so no, thank you so much for tonight. Um, and as I said, we'll try and maybe answer some of those questions that we haven't got to tonight. Um, and yeah, like you said, um, maybe leave it to me now to do my plugging. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye now. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for staying with us tonight. I know that we've uh, overrun a little bit, um, but I think it was really important to get some of those questions in with Johnny. Um, so really some final words uh, from me. And as Johnny said, to, to plug away, um, this is the first of one of our webinars in the new series. So the next one that we're running is on the 21st of July, um, and that's at 11 o'clock UK time, so 11 a.m. And that's Living Well with Progressive MS. Invites for that will be coming out on Friday, but you can also go to the website um, and uh, register there. You will receive a post-webinar email um, and the links on here. Um, and that will come out tomorrow via Zoom um, to everybody that's attended. Um, and that will give you the, the link to back to the website where you can get the video replay and the handout. Um, if you'd like to continue supporting OMS, then please either sign up for the e-newsletter if you haven't already, um, subscribe to get the free book, 
um, or even just listen to one of our podcasts. There's lots of information out there. Um, part of the press and an exclusive for tonight is that we have got a new OMS engagement survey for 2021, which is coming soon. Um, and that should be landing in your inboxes um, next month, so in July. And it's really your opportunity to tell us about you so that we can do better for you. Um, but more on that, but like I said, that's an exclusive tonight. Um, you'll notice for those that are already sort of dropping off that when you leave the webinar, there'll be a, a survey that will pop up um, looking for your feedback. Um, so anything that you want to put on there that would help us to improve the webinar going forward. Um, and then of course, there's the address that's on the slide at the moment, the email address, webinars at overcomingms.org. But anything that you'd like to either feedback about this webinar or uh, pose questions for future episodes. Um, so all that's left for me to say is thank you so much for attending tonight um, and joining uh, Johnny and myself. And a big thank you to Sophie also in the background uh, for facilitating some of those questions. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have and hope to see you soon.